master's in biology. So being in an oceanographic institute, I can talk to most of you. I occasionally Don as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's mainly in the hallway, though. Uh, over the years, we've been working on a, quite a number of topics, as well as uh, currently working in isotope biogeochemistry, looking at the origins of microbialites and stromatolites. Uh, those are some of the earliest uh, biosphere uh, concepts. And we've been working with Maya Breitbart and uh, others in Mexico and some beautiful sites in Cuatro Cienes. Actually, we abandoned uh, Cuatro Cienes, which is in the northern uh, Chihuahua desert. It gets a little dangerous nowadays down in, in northern Mexico. Uh, so we've moved our show down to Laguna Bacalar, which is uh, in the Yucatan by, uh, uh, by Belize. So also a nice site. Um, also in this... Uh, in the marine sciences here, we've been working in chemical ecology, uh, using stable isotopes specifically uh, to look at uh, aspects of how uh, uh, isotopes and chemical components of carbon and nitrogen are actually transferred through the food web and the dynamics of, uh, of trophic interactions, uh, looking at land use influences as well as creating novel uh, analytical approaches for uh, non-destructive approaches to uh, uh, getting at these questions of chemical ecology and ecosystem analysis. Uh, we've also been working in using these stable isotopes in organic geochemistry, uh, molecules specifically, molecular organic geochemistry, to look at paleoceanographic and paleoclimatic changes, uh, principally uh, in, uh, in our hemisphere, but uh, looking at the Cariaco Basin, the Amazon Basin. Uh, we've had uh, National Science Foundation uh, funding for this, as well as in the Gulf of Mexico, the Pygmy and Orca Basins, with a lot of researchers here as well as uh, elsewhere. Uh, today, I'm going to really focus on one of our topics that we've been uh, working on, and uh, I think you'll understand why. Uh, we've been looking at uh, sort of molecular and organic geochemical approaches associated with petroleum. So when petroleum's in the ground, it's called petroleum geochemistry, and you can look at source rocks. When it comes on top of the surface of the Earth, that turns into an environmental chemical problem. And so you can understand uh, aspects of the deep water horizon actually crossing over both of these, where uh, there was a large uh, blowout in the northern Gulf of Mexico in 2010. Any of you remember that? <laughs> Most of you remember that? OK, good. Uh, so we've, create, uh, we've been working uh, extensively on that, um, or on that project for the last four years. Uh, we've developed a center uh, with Steve Morawski uh, called Sea Image, and I'll introduce that later. But there's a whole host of characters, both here in the College of Marine Science, but also elsewhere, nationally and internationally, working on these problems. Uh, our research group uh, focuses in a lab, perhaps you've heard of, called the Paleo Lab. Uh, it's affectionately called the Paleo Lab. It was actually called the Paleoceanographic Paleoclimatology and Biogeochemistry Lab. That's quite a mouthful. So Paleo Lab works. Uh, I was one of the founding members in 2000, and now I'm the director. But there's we have uh, three co-directors: uh, Brad, who's here, uh, Jean Domac, as well as Amelia Chavanel. Uh, we actually have a broad interaction with a lot of the faculty here in the College of Marine Science. Upwards of 12 faculty work through the Paleo Lab, and over 30 students, PhD students, master's students, at any one particular time, are working, doing analysis through the Paleo Lab. Uh, I'm, I essentially am the, uh, run the facility, uh, so I supervise uh, our facilities coordinator, which we all owe homage to, uh, Ethan Goddard, who's over there. Uh, I have two research associates, Isabel Romero in the back, Patrick Schwing also in the back, uh, postdoctoral fellow Greg Ellis. Uh, we have two, post, uh, two doctoral students, Becca Larson and Jenny Fenton, and four research technicians working. The research technicians are not just doing technical work. A lot of them are presenting abstracts at conferences. As a matter of fact, Maya just won an award uh, through Gomery, the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, to present her work. So we're all very proud. Uh, these are some, just some pictures, and I just want to uh, talk to you about some of the work that we've been doing uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And sometimes when you work, uh, in summertime in the Gulf of Mexico on a ship, things can get hot. That says 140 degrees there, so uh, you better like the heat. Uh, so the topic that I'm going to be talking about today is getting that sinking feeling. And basically it's trying to understand the sedimentary fate of deep water horizon oil. How many of you have ever mixed oil and water? What happens? Oil stays on, oil floats. And I'm going to argue today that oil doesn't necessarily float. And that's kind of counterintuitive, and that's where we're going. Uh, the work that we're 
is, is funded through the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, uh, and our center, again, is uh, entitled C, uh, if you are quite fancy, C image or C image. <laughs> so what is C image? Uh, this is uh, uh, an acronym for the Center for Integrated Modeling and Analysis of Gulf Ecosystems. Uh, it, the, uh, this is a large funded center. Uh, Eleven million dollars was the first round of funding from 2011, 2012, 2014. Uh, Steve Morawski, who will be presenting next, is the center director. I'm the really, really, really lucky one. I'm the chief science officer, uh, so I don't have to be the heavy. Um, uh, Cheryl Gilbert keeps everybody intact in and uh, organized. Thank God <laughs> for Cheryl. And we've really worked out really a, a fantastic center of really integrated studies uh, uh, linking physics, chemistry, biology, and geology. Uh, looking at essentially the goals of the center is to understand the processes and impacts of marine oil well blowouts and to better inform oil spill response strategies. And that's a huge question with huge economic implications and really societally relevant questions. Uh, the original funding, again, as I said, was $11 million. Uh, you know, maybe it's not as prestigious as uh, the X Prize, uh, but it pays the bills. Uh, this is a, a coming out of the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, uh, which was uh, some of the five, about $500 million allocated by BP uh, to do Gulf of Mexico research. Uh, and this was uh, established for a 10-year based program, the $500 million. What's really great about this is that they created then an independent board and directorate, which really creates a firewall, an intellectual firewall between the industry which may not like some of the results we find about the fate and impacts of these kind of uh, large-scale marine blowouts. And so this creates this firewall, this independence between academia and industry, which is a privilege. Sea uh, Image is a global-based consortium. We have 18 partner institutions uh, surrounding the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, what's interesting is the first round of Gulf of Mexico funding was essentially the Northern Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. Uh, and, and I'll show you as I get to the end of the talk, we've migrated to the south, uh, incorporating partners in Mexico uh, to make it truly a comprehensive Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. We have uh, folks from Woods Hole, from Scripps, up in Canada at the University of Calgary, folks in uh, the Netherlands at Wageningen University, if you can pronounce that. Uh, as well as the Technical uh, University in Hamburg Harburg. Um, you can see the listing uh, of all of the research institutes there. And so, again, we have a pretty broad base uh, of research uh, program. So just don't lose track of really what happened during the Deepwater Horizon event. Uh, Eleven died during these events. So uh, it's, you know, a lot of times we do research that might not have a lot of uh, consequential implications for societally relevant events like death. Uh, this is one that did. Uh, it, not a minor amount of oil was spilled. Uh, 4.9 million barrels of oil, or 240 million gallons of liquid oil. And I'll emphasize that liquid, because when you spill oil into the environment, if it's gas, which petroleum is made up of both liquid hydrocarbons and gaseous hydrocarbons like methane, propane, butane, you don't pay for what you release from gas. You only pay for the liquid component of it. And I'll show you, about 30, 40% of it by mass was actually gas. So they're getting the deal on that. <laughs> so the federal, there's been enormous amounts of federal uh, investigations, pending lawsuits. Uh, recently this year, uh, the event was determined to be uh, criminally gross negligent. Uh, there's huge Clean Water Acts, no inerta fines, upwards now of 10 to $40 billion of fines are now accessed uh, or as a result of the, of the uh, court's decisions uh, to, the, uh, to BP. And again, BP from this, part of, their fun, uh, fun, part, of, part of their event was that they essentially created this $500 million of independent research to really allow us to focus on, on what's going on with, in the event of such a, global, uh, uh, such a, a regional scale disaster. Uh, of course, this is what you see on the surface, but in actuality, this is what was going on 1,500 meters below the surface of the ocean. This was a blowout that occurred on the ocean floor. The ocean floor was at 1,500 meters depth. The reservoir from which this 
oil was coming was about 18 kilometers below the seafloor. So this thing is coming out at an outrageous volume and pressure and temperature differential. So what do I mean by that? Essentially, uh, again, these hydrocarbons, oil and gas, were discharged as a result of this blowout. Two-thirds of the release was, uh, was liquid oil, which was occurring at about 60,000 barrels per day. Now, what was really uh, quite striking is initially it was determined to be 1,000 barrels per day, mm. then two, then five, 12, 19, 23, 32, and ultimately it ended up being 60,000 barrels of oil per day. And that's not even including the gas, which was also coming out at about 30,000 barrel equivalents. So this thing was pumping out at about 100,000 barrels of oil equivalents per day. Because of the depth of the reservoir, relative to the depth of the bottom of the ocean, the pressure differential was tremendous. Something on the order of 14,000 to 2,000 PSI differential. The temperature differential in the reservoir oil was about 150 degrees, shooting out into ocean water at 4 degrees. So you can only kind of imagine the kind of physical chemical reactions that were occurring both at the intra and intramolecular level, soluble hydrocarbons, insoluble hydrocarbons, and then, of course, a, a large component, which we won't discuss much of, but which has huge implications, is the, is the application of dispersants to try to ameliorate some of the impacts of the oil released into the environment. So when you think about such an event, and you have a, there's, there's an enormous amount of physics and chemistry that is going on with the release of such a blowout. Um, if you look at oil itself, and this is a, a gas chromatograph, which is a technique to use to look at the different molecules associated with organic components, and oil is a prime candidate for that, you can see there is each one of those lines is an, is an individual compound. How many compounds do you guys think are in oil, a typical oil? Would it be surprising to say 70,000 different compounds comprise the oil? It's a phenomenal range. But you have gases like methane, ethane, propane, which are very soluble. You have light aromatic hydrocarbons, which can also be soluble. But then you can start to get into these heavier molecular weight ranges, which are insoluble. So all of a sudden now you can start to think the soluble material should dissolve right into the seawater but the insoluble material should probably rise to the surface. But that's not necessarily the case. Remember, this stuff is coming out with such pressure and such temperature differential that it's shooting out like an aerosol can. It's like a nebulizer, if anybody has asthma. Uh, and what ends up happening is, release at the bottom, you can shoot out these oil, uh, this liquid hydrocarbon such that the droplets only go in the range, side range, of about 20 to 60 microns. And when they're only 20 to 60 microns, they actually are neutrally buoyant in the subsurface. So although you have insoluble hydrocarbons, they're actually entrained into different water masses as it moves on its way to the surface. So the rising velocity of those droplets, those micro droplets, are slower than the currents. So they're entrained and transported along with the currents. And so again, what determines these uh, these plumes, and some of you had heard of this, I'm sure, during the event, is that you had subsurface oil plumes, or subsurface plumes of oil in the northern Gulf of Mexico. Not all of the oil made it to the surface. Quite the contrary. An enormous amount stayed in the subsurface. And not only at single levels, but multiple, plu multiple in situ plumes were also recognized. Some of the work that we did early in the, uh, early in the uh, during the blowout, recognized a very, very large intrusion at about 1,000 meters that spanned about three to 400 meters thick, right? So that's, what, 1,200 feet thick? That's a pretty hefty th intrusion. We've also recognized an intrusion around 400 meters and, of course, at the surface. So you had really three distinct levels in the northern Gulf of Mexico that had variable amounts of oil at the surface in the subsurface at 400 meters, and then at 1,000 meters was the big one. So some of the work that we've been doing, let me, s Woo. 
Our colleague Claire Paris at the University of Miami uh, put together our hydrodynamic model which incorporates uh, oil droplet size. Lar uh, the red, the warm colors, are large droplets. The blues are the really small droplets. And you can see it quickly rises to the surface, but those small droplet sizes are entrained into the subsurface. They're actually uh, in the water mass. And to the northeast is the DeSoto Canyon, a very biologically relevant area. And you can see that that oil in the subsurface would impinge upon the continental slope. So there's a sediment interaction. Not only the surfacing material, but you had a whole dynamics of material that was in the subsurface. When people uh, uh, from NOAA released their original oil budget, it was a little bit unsettling in that you could say that approximately 25% was truly accounted for, but about 75% was unaccounted for. And they had some, uh, some kind of spurious terms like chemically dispersed, naturally dispersed, uh, which doesn't really mean removed from the environment. It still could have a biological consequence during the event. So one of the things that we decided to work on was trying to not resolve necessarily the budget, but of the 75%, where did this stuff go? What was its consequence? And so one of the things that we focused on was, could it possibly go into the sediments? We knew that the subsurface plumes were impinging on the sediment uh, continental slope. What was happening with all that surfacing oil? And was there any role of the response strategy that could influence the ultimate fate of the oil from the, these kind of blowouts? So we came to grips with sort of two basic hypotheses. One was that, the number one was the toxic bathtub ring. Uh, the soluble hydrocarbons are things like benzene, toluene, xylene, things that can remove paint, basically, or give you some healthy dose of cancer. So this was, we interpret this as the subsurface plumes that impinge upon the continental slope in the sediments. Remember, this is three, four hundred meters thick, this layer, could have a real consequence not only for the accumulation of those oils into the sedimentary system, but also have a significant biological impact. And then we recognize the potential of a second mechanism to bring oil down to the bottom. And we call that the flocculent dirty blizzard. And it's playing on the concept of marine snow, which we are all familiar with, but this wasn't marine snow in your typical sort of nice pastoral kind of settling down. We called it, it was really a blizzard of marine snow. And we called it dirty because of the incorporation of the hydrocarbons. So the two mechanisms that we really wanted to resolve and their relative importance was the toxic bathtub ring and the flocculent dirty blizzard. Uh, one of the real questions was, from the surfacing oil, did some of the response strategies which were used to keep the marsh system intact, keep the observational aspects of the oil on the surface to a minimum, did any of these have an impact? And there was basically three really um, important mitigation strategies that were used. The first is to to, make, to minimize the impact to the really vulnerable systems like the marsh. You know, anything that blinks has a real feeling to society. Birds, turtles, and the sort. And there are a lot of them in the marsh. So what they do is they open up the floodgates of the Mississippi and diversionary channels to try to push the water offshore. But with those opening up of those floodgates, you release a lot of entrained nutrients which are trapped in the marsh but also you release a lot of clay minerals. And that's a really two very important factors. The other mitigation strategy that they used was in situ burning. Of course, they would corral the oil and flame it up. And one concept would be, well, it burns all into the atmosphere as soot, but there's a lot of residual material that is not burnt, that actually then becomes quite dense and can sink quite readily. And there's, using molecular organic geochemical techniques, you can recognize these as what they call pyrogenic PAHs. PAHs are these polyaromatic, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which, again, can be toxic and carcinogenic. 
And of course, the third technique which they used, and this was not a minor amount, this was a million gallons of dispersant. And dispersants essentially attack the surface of the oil to make the droplet sizes finer. And as a result, it can become uh, quite, almost give you the sense that it kind of disappears from the environment. But what actually happens is the oil surface area, or the area of the droplets, increases. And it's well known in the oil geochemical world that oils and clays have a real affinity for each other. So when you put on dispersants to an area which is now being flooded with clay minerals, you're looking at this interaction between oil and clay bonding, and their buoyancy of the clay, or the lack of buoyancy, causes the oil to sink. So these, these kind of uh, techniques for uh, mitigation may help to give you an obvious, maybe societal sense that the oil has disappeared into the offshore region and into the open ocean. But the question is, is that really disappeared? What's the consequence of that? And so what we're going to say is that nothing comes for free. And so what the concept was is that when you have river, large river influences that give rise to clays and nutrients, those nutrients can stimulate uh, marine, bi uh, marine biota in a biological bloom. The oil and dispersants create the reaction so that the oil can interact with the clay minerals. But the oil and dispersants are also quite toxic to the marine algae. And the marine algae produces this substance called EPS, exopolymetric substance, like a goo, like a mucilaginous material. And that causes it to become incredibly sticky. So you have this triangulation of really terrible consequences when you have releasing a lot of clays and nutrients in an environment with oil and dispersants, with biological activity. All of a sudden, you can create these large flocculent materials. And consequently, that flocculent material can sink quite readily to the seafloor. Again, bringing all, a lot of that oil to the bottom of the ocean. So what we did is we did a lot of work in sediment coring to the north and east in the DeSoto Canyon area. But we also went to the south and west, up to the Mississippi River Delta area, as well as to the southeast. And what we did was something extraordinary. We did work on sediments at really high resolution, two millimeter intervals, you know, so thick. 